please work. Oh, please work. Hi. Um, I'm hoping this is working. Man, I feel like all my lives start this way. Um, hello, everybody. It is just past three because I was having some technical difficulties. Oh, and I am being told that people are watching. Hooray. Um, ah, hi, Ty. Oh, thank heavens. So for those of you who want the behind the scenes nitty gritty, usually I uh, test these lives uh, briefly with uh, in a private group to make sure that they're working properly. But I usually also do these lives using my or do these videos using my phone. Uh, every time I started to try to do it, the phone crashed. So that's been a fun thing to happen. So now I am speaking to you with my iPad, and I just hope that you can hear me okay, because I know the microphone and the video is not quite as good. Or I think it isn't. I'm not sure. Um, right. I'm also not sure if I flipped the screen properly, so let's see if I did that. I did! Woohoo! <laughs> Hi! <laughs> Welcome to uh, Horror Stories for October with Gail Carrier, and I thought I would tell you my horror stories from 10 years as a professional author. Um, we can also talk and do a Q&A and stuff, but I think I'm going to start by telling you some horror stories. You see, I, I have my dark, gothy mug so that we're nice and doomy. I even thought about wearing black, but I just look awful in black. It makes me all washed out, so... I could never be a goth. It's very sad. But, so I, I have a black mug. That's my nod to the dark side. Uh, this came from the Spy Museum, incidentally, when I did an event there, oh, many years, many years ago, which actually ties to the first horror story. Thank you for posting to the group. Hello, everybody. As ever, I love to know where you're uh, tuning in from, so if you want to leave a comment saying where you are, uh, I've said it before, I'll say it again, I do these lives because it's a way to get as many different people from in as many different parts of the world as possible. So I just love seeing where you're all from. And I promise, even if I don't catch you right now, I always go back and read all of the comments, uh, whether you're here on Facebook or whether this is on YouTube. So I always read all the comments just to make sure I haven't missed anything and I say hello to everybody. So, um, horror stories. Now, like most authors, I have the usual sets of horror stories, by which I mean being orphaned. So when writers talk about being orphaned, we mean that our editor has left us. Not always in death. Sometimes in death. But usually an editor leaves an author because the editor has taken a job or a better position at a different publishing house, or sometimes the editor has retired. And that's, we call that being orphaned, because they don't get to take us with them. Our contract is with the publisher, so we have to stay with whoever, with the publishing house, so we don't get to follow our editor, sadly. Sometimes we can be off orphaned by agents. I'm really lucky. I've never been orphaned by an agent. I have been orphaned by three or four, four editors now. I think it's four. A lot. <laughs> so that happens quite a bit. Uh, so I just, but that's, those are not the kind of horror stories I'm going to talk about, at least not really. My horror stories are uh, a little different, and forgive me if I'm looking over here, because I originally had my notes on the iPad, but I now have to record on it, so I'm, I have my notes over on a computer next to me. So um, the first horror story I'm going to tell you about is The Missing 500. So some of you tuning in may in fact have been around when this happened. It was back in... I believe 2012, and forgive me if I get dates wrong, because I get dates wrong a lot. It was when Waistcoats and Weaponry came out, which was the third finishing school book. It uh, came out, the first two had done really well, people were really excited about the third one. It came out in, uh, I want to say October or November. Those books were usually released in the fall. And I was going to, it was November. I was going to go to World Fantasy in Washington, D.C. Um, and that's when I went to the, I was going to launch the book at the Spy Museum. And I had just been on book tour. So I had a week-long book tour. So generally speaking, they send you out on book tour starting on like a Monday or a Tuesday. And then you do the whole week. And then I was ending with World Fantasy and the Spy Museum. I had a brand 
new editor for this book. So I was meeting her. My original acquiring editor had left. So I was meeting my new editor. Um, so I was a little nervous about that. And something very exciting had happened. Because the first two books in the Finishing School series had done so well, they thought, hey, we'll get Gail to sign 500 books. Now, it was Barnes & Noble who decided to do this, and it was great, it was very supportive of them, because what they were then gonna do was offer an online-only deal where if you bought the physical hardcover of Waistcoats and Weaponry from them, from Barnes & Noble, you, you could have the option of choosing to have a signed edition. Logistically, this is very complicated because they have to get the books, the books had already gone to print, so they couldn't send, send me Tiptons, which is how we did the signed editions later for like the illustrated solace and stuff. Tiptons are just sheets and I just sign all the sheets. Because this book had already gone to print, they had to send me the books. So, so they said to send me 500 cop hardcover books of waistcoats and weaponry. I was like, I have a tiny, tiny house and an even tinier office. I can't, I, there's no room for 500 books. You have to figure out where I'm gonna sign them. So they shipped them to a local hotel and they rented out a room in the local hotel and they had a media manager type who came and flipped all the pages for me while I signed 500 copies of Waistcoats and Weaponry. And then because I'm me, I took a photograph and documented it and posted it to Instagram and told everybody about it. Cause it was exciting. This was the first time this, I'd been asked to do something like this. So I'd signed all these 500 books, then I had sent them back, and then here is what happened. <laughs> right, literally, as I am going on to book tour, because that is when this happens, because it's launch date, which means the books are supposed to be shipping, right? They're supposed to be shipping to everybody who ordered them. Barnes & Noble sends out Five, and, and I had talked this up. I had been excited about it. I had told you all about it. People had ordered them. I mean, it was a big deal as far as I was concerned. And we did something amazing. You and I, we sold all 500 of them. And it was awesome, right? Like, I was super excited. Look at my fans. Look at them go. I was very proud. <laughs> um, and uh, then Barnes & Noble sent out 500 emails saying that this order had been canceled. That they were, in fact, not going to ship these signed editions at all. There'd be no sign. Now, this is what I mean by an author horror story. <laughs> so here I am. I am in the middle of a book tour. And because it is my name that is on the book, I start to get emails from everybody. Just from you, from fans who are saying, where is my book? Why did Barnes & Noble do this? Why is it being canceled? And I'm, of course, like calling my publisher, calling my agent, trying to figure out what's going on. I have no answers. Barnes and Noble, when they're gotten, they're they, um, you know, the the liaison for Barnes and Noble to my publishing house. They claim that the publisher never gave it to them. The publisher is claiming that absolutely they gave it to them, and Barnes and Noble seems to have lost them somewhere in some warehouse. So, all of those five hundred books that I signed just poof, just vanish into the ether, and I am left with. 500 emails from people being like, where is my book? And it's the launch of the book, right? So those 500 books would have counted towards my first week of sale. But because Barnes & Noble decided to cancel it, and you know, people are understandably angry. They're not just gonna go and buy an unsigned one or you know, they're, they're gonna wait and see if this gets fixed somehow. I lost all of those sales. And for those of you who don't know, the New York Times list, when you make the bestsellers list, 500 books can make or break whether you get on that list. And Waistcoats and Weaponry did in fact not make the list. It was the first of my books not to do that. Um, partly because of this kerfuffle. So I'm dealing with, and then guess who the publisher gets angry with? Me, because I didn't make the publishing list, right? They forget that this whole thing happens. So. I'm dealing with this while I'm on book tour. So I am like flying, landing, answering emails, trying to fix this problem, try, the, going to a book launch event, talking about the book, going to a hotel in a foreign city, sleeping, waking up, answering more emails, going back to the, <laughs> going back to a, <laughs> flying again, da, da 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 I've done this for a week. I finally land at World Fantasy and I am just pretty worn and wrecked as, as you could imagine. Um, and it still hasn't been solved. And nobody knows where these books are. The books haven't shipped. Everybody's pissed off about everything. Um, 
And I ended up at World Fantasy on Saturday night having done, no, I hadn't done the Spy Museum yet, so it must have been Friday night, um, just talking about this with two of my best author friends and getting very drunk and getting very sad. And then I just started bawling in the bar at a convention because I was, it's just frustration. Like that was really what was, I mean, and it was just this profound sense of disappointing you mostly because I've said it before, but like I do this because I love you guys. Like I, I, I write because I have a reader base. I would always write, but I certainly wouldn't produce and I certainly wouldn't book tour and I certainly wouldn't do events if I didn't have people who wanted that for me. Um, I would just, you know, write one book every five years or something and go dig things up as an archaeologist. Um, so I just felt so horrible and guilty and frustrated and confused because at least if we knew what would happen, I could say to people what had gone wrong and and everybody was playing the blame game. Um, and so I'm just sobbing. <laughs> I need to imagine a very kind of wet, sad Gail wearing a teal gown. <laughs> Um, just like sobbing into her Moscow mule or whatever I was drinking at the time. And it was just the most, it was, it, it was a horrible thing to have happened, but the most magical thing came out of this, which was these author friends of mine, and they're very dear friends, but this moment kind of crystallized that for me, just kind of surrounded me. There was this immediate like shoomp of like protective fellow authors just huddling in on me and kind of hiding me so nobody saw the name makeup running and just like hugging me and being like it'll be okay we will fix this problem um one and you can hear i'm like tearing up a little bit because the memory is so profound uh one of those is peter brett and the other one is wesley shu um but it was pete who came up with the answer for me and pete is like i can solve this problem for you because Pete has a lot of super fans um, overseas, so he lives in the United States, but he has a lot of, of major fans in places like Germany. So what he does is he doesn't ship books because it's, it's prohibitively expensive, but he ships a lot of like um, signed book inserts or book plates. And so he's used to this kind of thing. And so what he says is, look, look, here's your solution. You're going to just tell people right now that you're on tour and you'll get back to them as soon as you get home. And then when you get home, you just reply to every single email and you say, I will sign and, ma and mail you a book plate. Um, and that's exactly what I did. So thank heavens for Pete. <laughs> but yeah, so that week when I got home, I then signed about 300 book plates for all of the people who had sent me emails um, and who wanted it. And I went on Twitter and I went on social media and I went on my blog and I said, look, we still don't know what happened to those 500 books, but if on on your honor if you are one of the people who bought that book and didn't get it i if you want to give me your mailing address i will snail mail you a a signature that you can then insert into your book um and that's what it is so i done signed another 300 <laughs> book plates and sent them off and mailed them off and addressed all of the letters and sent them off in the mail so that was that was my my big that's probably in living memory that is my biggest um my biggest horror story. To this day, we have no idea what happened to those books. Um, and here's the stickler to this story. That was one publishing house. A different publishing house came to me when Prudence was going to be published and said, hey, guess what? Barnes & Noble has offered us a deal. If you sign 500 books for them, they will push you front and center and they will put it up as a signed special edition. And I said, hell no. And they said, what can we do to make you do this for us, Scale? Because, like I said, those 500 sales can really make or break a book. And I said, if this goes wrong, you give me your email, and I send that email to everyone. Also, I'm going to get out front of this from the get-go, and while I will promote that there are signed editions, I'm not going to guarantee anything. I'm gonna like point people to this kerfuffle because I talked about this later, the missing 500. So I signed 500 editions of Prudence and guess what happened? Why yes, Barnes & Noble lost those as well. Ah! <laughs> yeah. So uh, still not, so now there are a thousand signed Gale books somewhere in the ether. Uh, 500 Waistcoats and Weaponry and 500 Prudence. Um, ain't that fun? 
uh, yeah, but that time I had, like, you know, it became my publisher's problem. Um, so, uh, codicil to this story is several years later, I had a representative from Barnes & Noble come up to me at a soiree who was like, um, I just wanted to apologize to you for losing all of those books that time. And I was like, which time? <laughs> I was like, do you ever find out what happened to them? Uh, yeah, who knew a Barnes & Noble rep would apologize to an author? That's a red letter day, that is. Uh, right. That's my first major horror story. How do you guys feel about that one? <laughs> I'm gonna have a drink of water. <laughs> so, um, yeah, the next day after my crying drunken jag, um, at Waistcoats and Weppery at World Fantasy, I, I then went to the Spy Museum and did my thing there. So for those of you who are at the Spy Museum, there's actually a video of this somewhere on YouTube. Uh, the reason I'm so low energy has to do with what I just dealt with the night before. Um, and honestly, a lot of you are like, how does this happen? I, I'm still mystified. Uh, but big companies and books and warehousing and shipping like things get lost what can I say um somebody made a mistake somebody didn't realize that that was the palette that was signed that you know it wasn't tracked properly I don't know but to have it happen twice I was like this is bonkers um so actually one of the reasons that for the illustrated soulless which I don't have a version of here um but you you remember what the illustrated edition looks like. For the illustrated edition of Soulless, the reason I signed the entire first print run, I think, is because they wanted me to do it again for, uh, the, I, I think Barnes & Noble wanted me to do it again, and my publisher knew that I just would not do it. They knew that there was no chance. So instead, they basically said, well, what if we just asked Gail to sign them all? <laughs> whole print run and they thought initially with the still soulless illustrated edition that they were only gonna do like 5,000 of them and that's not too many books and because you guys got so excited about the illustrated edition I ended up signing 10,000 of them but at least they didn't lose them right that's the solution sign the entire first print run make the author do a month's worth of signing um yeah, so I think it's because of these two big kerfuffles that, and them losing a thousand books, that they, um, that they made me sign 10,000 books for the illustrated edition. Mm, that's what I think. I, I don't have that confirmed. Yeah, my poor hand. Yeah, I, I, I learned a lot of lessons with this. One of the things for the ten, signing those 10,000 books was it takes me almost two months to do that. And it's just because my hand gets too sore. I just have to take breaks and stop. Um, I just have to stop like every 100 books I sign. Um, live and learn. This is the thing about the author industry. Every time I think I've figured it out, something else happens and I'm like, oh, this is a new learning experience. Um, that was my first horror story. Save your questions. I promise I will get to them in a little bit. Ooh, my first horror story took 20 minutes. Oh, I'll tell you my second horror story. Um, <laughs> this is kind of a fun one. Okay, and I feel okay telling this now, but I should warn you, it's going to get a little racy. So, if you have little pictures, as my grandmother used to say about children, you might want to go to um, earphones <laughs> if you can. Um, right, so this is my book tour. So, um, I had a, a great book tour for Prudence, despite the fact that they lost the books that time, because I was prepared, so didn't worry me. Prudence was good. Um, for Imprudence, the second book in the Custard Protocol series, my publisher decided that what they really wanted to do was put me on a two-week book tour. So usually my book tours were only ten, a week to ten days. They decided this time we were going to do two weeks of book touring, and I was like, all right, um, here we go. Uh, and there I went. That's a lot of traveling. Book tours are pretty rough because it is this sort of cycle of you fly, you land, you check into a hotel, you get dressed, you do an event. If you're lucky, you find food, you sleep, you do this again and again. I do that for 10 days and just go all the way in. You lose track of what time zone you're in. It's bonkers. Um, Imprudence was the book tour from hell. It was the worst book tour I have ever been on in my life in indescribable ways. 
uh, which is why it's it's here on Author Horror Story Hour. <laughs> so normally on a book tour, it's it's pretty seamless. I'm used to it. Like Imprudence was what my thirteenth. 18th book? I don't know. Some teenth book. It was, it'd been a long time. I've been a, a while at this when, when Imprudence came out. But Imprudence came out in the middle of the summer. Now, the summer has lots of problems, not the least of which is the heat. It was an August release, but also a lot of people are traveling in the summertime who don't normally travel. So the lines are worse. The thing when you do business travel, when you're in like a midweek school year travel time is it's you, me, crazy author girl, and a bunch of businessmen and business women and business persons. And they have all, you know, we all know what we're doing, right? <laughs> like we all have our carry on suitcases and <laughs> our snack packs and our grumpy expressions. And we're typing away on the 45 minute flight and we shut when we're told to and we put our seat backs up when we're told to if we even put them back and we deplane like a mopo and we're out and we're off right it's seamless summer travel is not like that it turns out there are other weird things about summer travel um so the i don't exactly remember the order in which things these things occurred so i'm gonna just throw them at you two weeks imagine this two weeks haven't been home up down up down up down constant events constantly traveling, full of crazy non-travelers on planes. And what's the first thing that happens? Eh, I don't remember the first thing, but I do remember Austin. Austin, I'm leaving in the morning, super early. I did a book people event the night before. I go into, it's early. It's like 7.38. The airport's pretty empty. I go in to use the restroom because I have the tiniest bladder in the universe. And I think somebody is being attacked in the ladies' restroom because there is a lot of crashing and banging and squealing. And I think, oh shoot, what's going on? <laughs> like, do I need to call security? Ah. Uh, then I realize what's happening is someone's having sex in the ladies' bathroom uh, in Austin at 7.30 in the morning. Interesting choice. Now, not necessarily something I would be too upset with, except it, it did sound very violent. <laughs> I was very concerned for a little while and then I finally decided that mm, nah I'll just let them get on with it I guess. Um, and it did seem like it was a couple of it was two women it, you know. Um, right so there's that. I wouldn't have been too perturbed except earlier in this book tour I had been sitting on a flight next to a lone uh, what's the word I'm looking for? tween, perhaps, aged individual uh, who had the middle seat. I was in the aisle. I'm always in the aisle. And there was a businessman who was in the window seat. Neither of us are in any way related to the junior child person who is between us. And I am uh, typing away because in addition to a book tour, I have a deadline. And said child person next to me begins to masturbate. Uh, kind of just puts his jacket over himself and just goes to it in the seat right next to me and I am basically like I'm not equipped to handle this I don't know what to do I am an old person I shouldn't even be noticing what's going on next to me and yet it is right next to me on a plane <laughs> to I don't know Houston or something uh, so I had already had a very awkward sexual encounter, and now I was having another awkward sexual encounter in a bathroom. Right. So, uh, those were two of the things that happened on the plane, well, on this book tour. Uh, the next thing that happened on this book tour is that I'm going into San Diego in August. Guess what's also happening in San Diego in August? Why well, guess. It is Comic-Con. My publisher gets the brilliant idea that what should I do? I should not only do a book event at Mysterious Galaxy. Hi, Mysterious Galaxy. I love you. That That's awesome. Always awesome. But we'll also have Gail land, go to Comic-Con, and <laughs> do a signing at Comic-Con for, oh, 20 minutes or so, right? At Comic-Con. 250,000 people. I'm supposed to get in and get out in 20 minutes. What airport am I leaving to get catch this flight to San Diego? I'm leaving Denver. What is my Hellmouth Hel Airport? Why, 
Denver is my Hellmouth Airport. What does my Hellmouth Airport always want to do? It wants to keep me. It wants to keep me forever. So what happens? Oh yeah, I get stuck at Denver. <laughs> so now I am late. So originally, the idea was I would get in super early in the morning and have an early check-in, have a like an hour to recoup before I went to Comic-Con. Instead, I am flying later on that morning to Denver, uh, uh, from Denver to San Diego. And what do I have to do? Why, I have to change in the bathroom on the plane. <laughs> oh my goodness. Luckily, when I was like checking in to that flight the day before, I spontaneously like decided to upgrade myself. I don't do this very often, but um, I was just having such a bad book tour and they had like a $50 to upgrade to first class deal all of a sudden on this flight. And I was like, sure, I'll take that. So, but it was still very weird for my seatmate in first class to see me stand up, go to the bathroom with my suitcase, transform, put on the nylons, put on the makeup and reemerge from the restroom, sit back down. And she was like, whoa. And I was like, yeah, going to Comic-Con. And, uh, she also, because first class, I'm not used to it, um, she ordered champagne and I was like, oh, we can do that? You mean I could, I could drink at, at 11 in the morning on the way to Comic-Con? Great! So then I started drinking. So I land, catch a taxi to downtown San Diego with all of my luggage and everything, I am I am late. I am tweeting as I as we're getting there. I'm like, I'm sorry, you guys. I'm late for my signing at Comic Con. I'm late. I make it. They get me in. I managed to do everything that I was supposed to do. Uh, it all worked out very well. But I was also tipsy <laughs> the whole time. Then I finally get back to my hotel. I had about I don't know ten minutes to change into my evening outfit uh, before I went to Mys Mysterious Galaxy <laughs> for my actual event that night. So that also happened on the Imprudence book tour. What's next? Um, ah, yes. <laughs> you see, I'm doing this out of order because prior to that, Denver, also a good time in August, it turns out. One of the things I didn't know about Denver is that it gets extremely hot in August in Denver, sometimes. So I land uh, in Denver, ill-prepared for this. It is 102 degrees. And um, I am not joking, that is not exaggeration. I am not dressed for that. I am dressed for cold aeroplanes. And forever, for wherever I had previous been, get off the flight, go down, get the taxi to my hotel. The taxi drops me at the wrong hotel <laughs> in 102 temperature. Now I can see my actual hotel some distance away, but I can see it. So I think I'll just walk to it. But these are like, you know, the chain hotels on the side of highways. Yeah. That wasn't a brilliant idea. So there I am, I am slogging with my suitcase in 102 temperatures in Denver between one hotel and another hotel and I get a telephone call. Guess who's on the line? Why, it's my agent. And I was like, ah, this is an excellent timing because this is not the phone call you get when you make the New York Times because I know what day that happens and we blew by that day. Imprudence didn't make the Times, which is one of the reasons I stopped doing book tours. But also, this book tour is one of the reasons I stopped doing book tours. So I was like, this phone call is a different phone call. And yeah, it was. It was my agent calling to tell me that my editor of 10 years was leaving. Uh, eight years at that juncture, sorry. She was leaving me. Uh, but this was my first major, no, my second major orphaning, but this was my major orphaning. This was the editor who acquired Solus, who had my back for years. Uh, so I'm in a hundred, like, sweating buckets, 102 temperatures, slogging between hotels, and, uh, I learned that I'm losing my editor as well. Um, yeah. So this is why this was the book tour from hell. Uh, and I think that that was the only thing. That was <laughs> the last thing. So I have to say, not making the New York Times was kind of the least of my problems on that particular book tour. Uh, yeah, and so if you uh, want to know why I don't do book tours anymore now, you know. <laughs> uh, yeah, I'll do book launches though, don't you worry. Like, I had a, that awesome book launch in Denver last time I was there for competence. So don't worry, I still do them. I just, uh, I don't just, I don't do the traveling anymore. It's just, it killed me. 
that book tour killed me. I am still shocked that I survived. And that's, that is knowing, I think it was my second book tour for Blameless, I got laryngitis and super sick, and that was still a better book tour. <laughs> right. Those are my horror stories. Uh, and uh, it is now, oh, we now have a good 20 minutes for a Q&A if you guys would like to ask me some questions. Uh, clearly I'm in a forthcoming mood, so um, yeah, I, uh, I'll be happy to answer any questions you might have if, about horror. Um, in, horror right now is the fact that I am in fact moving offices, so, uh, but the upside of moving offices is I have a new office, and I'm very excited about it. And I get to decorate it. <laughs> you all know I love that. So um, I'll post pictures, I promise. Uh, it's really hard to photograph the empty office because it's just the layout makes it hard to photo. But I will try to um, get some pictures so that I can um, post to you what the new office looks like after I've decorated it. Eee! <laughs> but it does, uh, I thought it was going to be delayed on Dimity, but I, I made my, I like managed to do that. So, uh, so that's, Pretty much occupying a lot of my time right now is uh but the dimity book has been revised and uh uh monday i reach out to beta readers and so we get that going um right now i'm thinking valentine's day for that book oh no not valentine's day sorry don't 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 no it's gonna be like may probably for the dimity book valentine's day for the meet cute digital release and um sometimes around the holidays for the audio digital release of meet cute so those are the things that I have on the docket. And um, next up, I'm going to be revising the Heroine's Journey nonfiction book. And um, then my agent is going to take that out to see if anybody's interested in publishing it. And then I work on the Enforcer Enigma, the next San Andreas book. So that's what my plans are like for the rest of this year, basically. Um, and moving offices, which uh, I'm, I went through all of the stages of grief with my office where I was like, you know, angry and upset and mad and da 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 da. Um, and now I'm like a gleeful euphoria, which I didn't know was a stage of grief, but apparently it is, uh, because I'm getting rid of all of the stuff. For those of you who, who aren't in the Parasol Protectorate group, I've been posting there. Um, so I've been selling off like first editions and signed editions of things. So, um, yes. Oh, am I recruiting beta readers? No, uh, I have an excellent team of incredibly reliable beta readers and I'm pretty exacting. Um, and so long as the, they stick with me, I don't need any new beta readers. But actually one of my criteria when I was looking for beta readers was people who didn't want to be a beta reader. <laughs> Cause I don't really need a beta reader who likes my stuff too much. I kind of want somebody who is a little, uh, aggressively assessive, I guess. Um, who doesn't get too caught up in the book. You need a beta reader who has a really strong critical eye. Um, and most specifically, I need beta readers who are really familiar with my own world and the continuity of that world, because I have so many reoccurring characters and crossover stories and stuff like that, that the beta readers are really who are most responsible for um, making sure that I don't get e angry emails from you because I miscolored somebody's eyes or something in one of the books. <laughs> um, Gail, you have a question, maybe? I'm assuming everybody's got questions now. Um, oh no. Uh, Gail is asking for suggestions for transitioning uh, young adult books. Um, I have a... Uh, sorry, uh, I don't know if it's the right age, but um, if you Google Gail Carragher gender fluid I have a couple of blog posts on the subject of the research that I did for the fifth gender, but also for book recommendations on like genderqueer, non-binary, um, and uh, other types of sexual identity that I haven't written about yet or, or what have you. Um, that blog post full of fiction recommendations includes a YA section, which I've actually been continually expanding on. And there might be something there for you if, if people in the comments don't have a recommendation for you. Um, so yeah, Gail, go check those out check out the blog post. The blog post, you need to just, just Google Gail Carragher gender fluid and it should pop right up in the search results. Um, Courtney, uh, same thing, uh, from me anyway, any 
Courtney wants to know if I have any YRX for the friendly neighborhood non-binary librarian. Um, that that blog post is the one that I would direct you towards. Also, there is a great uh, recommendation blogger called Lesbrary. It's like lesbian and library combined into one word. She's a Tumblr blogger. She does a lot of non-binary YA recs. Um, her bent is towards sapphic, but um, she's she reads pretty widely, and she's got a couple of other like reviewers on board now who also read relatively widely. And I actually think uh, Book Riot might have had a recent blog post within the past week on the subject as well. Um, Catherine wants me to do an old-fashioned train bookstore, like on a train. That would be cool. That would take a lot of time, though. But I might be able to write while I was on the train, so maybe I wouldn't lose. Because that's the other thing, is I really struggle to write when I'm touring, um, and so I lose weeks of writing time if I go on a book tour. Which means the next book is in trouble. Stephanie says, I don't like brunettes. All of my heartthrobs are blonde or redheaded. Brunettes in terms of the... I don't know what you're talking about because Madame LeFou is like the biggest heartthrob there is. So is Biffy. They're both brunettes. I question your premise. <laughs> um, I have a lot of brunette heroines and I think they're heartthrobs. Um, if you mean the men, Connell's a brunette. Um, so, no, I don't think you're right. Ah, book wants to know whether what I put makeup on for earlier today and any anything about uh, right uh, yes the earrings and this necklace are jet the earrings are they're both cut jet uh, the earrings are modern the necklace is vintage um, yeah uh, got these at, at a convention actually um, when I was working uh, in a corset booth back in the good old days. And where did, uh, so book is alluding to the fact that I always do lives when I've already put my makeup on for a previous event. <laughs> That's why I schedule them when I do. And usually it is the second Saturday of the month because I have my RWA chapter meeting in the morning. That's what I have the makeup on for. Um, I wasn't presenting or anything. I just go. Uh, I, I just love my ladies and a couple of gentlemen who belong to the RWA chapter. Uh, they're just really cool writers and really fun to hang out with and chat with and... Um, I actually have a role. I'm, I'm the PAN representative, which just means the professional author, author network representative. So I kind of report to them what's going on in the industry and the gossip that I've, I've seen amongst authors for the month. It's, I, I really just, if I'm in town, I try not to miss the chapter meeting. It doesn't, doesn't, there's usually a presentation on a specific topic as well, and the topic doesn't always particularly interest me, but I just love the chapter meeting, and I love my local chapter. It's the San Francisco... RWA chapter for anybody who's local and may be interested. Um, the Silicon Valley chapter is also really good. I've been known to go down there and hang out with them sometimes too. They're awesome. We are really lucky that we have two like killer chapters in the San Francisco Bay Area, so I like to take advantage of it. Yeah, so that's where I was earlier. Then we have, we have a little lunch, and then I dash back home, and then I get everything ready, and then I dash over here, and then my tech fails me, <laughs> but we solved it all eventually. Cats like trains. <laughs> Ty wants to know how Sitek is doing. Fine, as always. Grumpy, as usual, but fine. Uh, Stein wants to know if I have any tattoos. What an interesting question. Uh, I do not, and it is not because I am against tattoos in any way. Uh, I have dated many tattooed folks in my day, um, and I happen to love tattoos. I think they're very sexy. Uh, but I don't have any for one very strange reason, <laughs> um, which is... I think from a distance, they often look like bruises, and I just don't want, and I, the black and white ones at least, or sometimes the colored ones as well, and I just don't want to walk around with people thinking I'm bruised, so that's why I don't have one. I'm also obsessed with symmetry in general, um, so if I got a tattoo, it would be in the, the middle of my body somewhere, rather than, or I would get one on each arm or something like that, and I've just never loved something enough, loved any image enough to want that. Um, the spot I always liked the best was actually the tramp stamp spot for a tattoo, um, and then everybody else was getting one there. So then I was like, well, I, I don't want to be like everybody else. I'm not going to get one there. 
that's, and then, you know, and now I'm old. I don't care anymore. <laughs> now it's too much of a bother. And honestly, I'm really wimpy when it comes to pain. Like, really, really wimpy. So... I do admire it though. Um, I'm particularly a big fan of people who do like full body art tattoos that are all cohesive, like those huge like skeletal ones or body armor looking ones. Um, yeah, one of my best friends in the whole world um, is practically tattooed from head to foot, uh, and it looks amazing on her. Like she, it's so sexy, but it's just it's just not for me. Kristen said she loves my nails. Thank you. This is my reverse French tip thing. I love it. Uh, you know why? Because I get gels so that they last practically forever. And as it grows, you can't tell that it's growing out. So they're also really lazy. This is like three weeks old, maybe? Yeah. I love it. Gel manicure is the greatest, the greatest achievement of technology as far as I'm concerned. Yeah, everybody's coming up with good brunette heartthrobs, so I think we're doing all right. Robert wants to know if I have horror stories of other authors. Ooh, Robert, aren't you uh, gossipy? <laughs> um, I guess, yes. I don't oh, remember the names of a lot of them, but I did, you know, I do come out of science fiction and fantasy, and I was in fandom very young. I went to my first convention as a as a younger teenager and that was back in the Star Trek I was a dyed-in-the-wall Star Trek the next generation serious Trek fan and I went to create a thons I think they were called when I was in high school um, so I think my first convention was probably around age 14 or so um, and that was all Star Trek and then when I turned and I was a really independent kid so as soon as I got um, a driver's license and stuff when I was 16 my parents you know, crazy hippie parents were just like, okay, do whatever you want. Like, don't get killed. <laughs> um, so then I started going to my local convention, which was Baycon. Um, and I would just go, a group, big group of us from high school would just rent a hotel room together and all pitch in and, and just go down and do the convention. It was great. Um, so I've had author encounters that were kind of rough from those days. Uh, in terms of like being an enthusiastic fan and running up to an author. And, and frankly, they were they were unpleasant at the time, but worthwhile later on because they taught me how not to be as an author, how not to be dismissive. And now I, you know, now I understand. Now I'm like, oh, maybe they were having a horrible book tour or um, maybe they were, they're just super shy and really uncomfortable when someone gets excited to, to meet them. Um, but it definitely was, I definitely always wanted to be a writer and I definitely always thought to myself, even, you know, back then, if, if I am lucky enough to ever get to, to get to do this, I'm going to take these as lessons how not to behave. Um, you know, don't be boring on panels. Make sure, um, I don't know, like, I know what my responsibility is when I am showing up in order to be present and in front of people. And that is partly as an entertainer. I write fiction. I entertain. I'm an entertainer. And I should attempt, at least, to be that way when I'm in public um, as an author as well. So I, I learned a lot of things from some very awkward encounters when I was a fangirl, I will say that much. Later on, as a professional author, um, we tend to be pretty courteous to each other. I've never had any like super sleazy, um, me too-y experiences myself. I definitely have had friends who've had that, and I definitely have had suspicions. But I've always acted in a pretty protective way about myself and my autonomy. Um, I didn't even realize I was doing it, but I tend to sort of collect a group of friends around me, many of whom are male authors, um, who act as, like, as escorts and protectively towards me. Later on, I, I have, um, a couple of, uh, friends who are also fans amongst you who are watching right now, who've kind of acted as sort of quasi-bodyguards for me, um, and not because I expect something negative to happen, but just because... Um, people feel protective towards me, which is really nice. I don't, I don't take that as an insult. Uh, but I also haven't, haven't really had any um, bad experiences, fortunately, in in that regard, with regards to like being groped or anything like that. Um, and uh, sometimes I wonder if that's to do with the way I look and the way I dress, and you know, the gloves and the politeness. 
Um, it's hard for an old dude, and it's usually an old dude, to be sleazy to a younger uh, lady author if she looks and dresses a lot like his mother did. Mm. Um, so maybe that's working in my favor? <laughs> I don't know. Um, so far as like negative experiences in terms of like fellow authors attitudes or um, whatever, I have a pretty thick skin, quite frankly, and I understand that I have a, a kind of type of a personality. I'm pretty aggressive. I'm pretty loud. Um, I'm definitely in your face, you know, which is for introverts can be a problem. <laughs> I definitely know what I like and know who I am, and I don't really bother with people who aren't into it. Um, and so I always just assume that I'm not everybody's cup of tea as a person. And so if you don't like me, that's fine. Um, we're, we're not going to be friends then. I, that's, that's okay. I have lots of friends. We'll be all right. Um, so that's kind of my attitude with fellow authors. So I, I suspect there are probably some out there that like have taken against me and maybe given me attitude, and I've just been like, La 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 la. Okay, <laughs> whatever. Ooh, there's somebody cool. I'll go talk to them. So that kind of is is my attitude in that regard. Um, and I do have a few that I, I'm not going to name names. Sorry if you came here for that <laughs> level of gossip. But I do have a few that I don't hang out with. Um, I, I, I will name names in terms of a couple that are no longer with us. And Harlan Ellison is one of those. Um, I, I, I've not hidden the fact that I would not be in a room with him ever. Um, so there were circumstances when I was a younger baby author, um, and if he entered a room, I, I would leave it, in fact. Um, so, yeah. And, and that's knowing that he has had some very interesting and powerful things to say about paying writers and protecting our own interests as writers from the business end of the perspective. But also, I was in the audience as a fan when he groped Connie Willis on stage. And um, it changed my life uh, in terms of me realizing as a woman in fandom that this was not a safe space. And until that moment, I thought it was a safe space. Um, and then to watch one of the greatest writers in science fiction, Connie Willis, get like molested on stage. Uh, by this troll of a man, um, totally changed everything about m me and how I looked at uh, conventions and the writer's world. And I was just, I was just in the audience. I wasn't, I wasn't even a professional author at the time. Um, and so I, I've never, I, I never really met him or had anything to do with him or anything, but I, I just decided never to share a space with him either. So... So there's a horror story for you. There's a real horror story. That was a real downer. <laughs> I try not to talk um, about depressing stuff like that. But, you know, that affected kind of the way I thought about being on stage and the Hugo Awards and many, many things. Um, that one incident, which you can you can look up. It's recorded for posterity. Um, how about some other questions, horror stories? Uh, there's a lot of chattering going on <laughs> in, in the comments. You guys are sharing books with each other and um uh right we're, we're discussing author horror stories and i think i'm probably winding us down soon um yeah but uh ty says it's six fifty six. right it is in fact almost time to shut us down so um, yeah, Charity, I totally agree with you. Charity says that that moment of realization that fandom isn't safe, um, especially for women, uh, is a defining moment for many of us. And yeah, and I, you know, like I said, I'd been in fandom since I was around 14, and it wasn't until that moment. And I must have been in my 20s. It must have been about 24. So I must, it must have been quite a ways, um, about 10 years into fandom that it took me to realize um, that. But, uh, like I said, since I've been a pro author, I haven't really had any... Uh, unpleasant experiences, unless you count incredibly boorish individuals, <laughs> which I count, but <laughs> it's mostly just like, oh, do we have to have this conversation? <laughs> could I, could we talk about tea? Could we talk about your favorite food? Um, that is my favorite thing to ask people now is what's your favorite soup? <laughs> I've decided that if I know your favorite soup, I can figure out what kind of person you are. <laughs> So instead of like at cocktail parties or whatever, if I'm, I'm talking to people, instead of asking them what they do for job or something, I'm like, oh, hi, nice to meet you. What's your favorite soup? Because I am that weirdo. <laughs> uh, 
Um, Stein wants to know if I find it hard as a public figure to voice political opinions. That's kind of a horror story, too. <laughs> um, I just don't. Uh, I was listening to an interesting podcast recently that was talking about the culture of outrage. And I just don't like to participate in that culture. Um, uh, I do follow politics. I am mildly political. My partner is very political, uh, as in did youth and government and uh, does advocacy and stuff like that. Um, but I'm not. Uh, or I'm not uh, vocally that way. So I guess um, I just don't consider it my role. This is hard for me to articulate, but I feel like um, you guys come to my books for something and you probably will get my political leanings from my books whether you like it or not like I can't keep the way I was raised or what I believe out of my books but um you come to me because you want mostly entertainment and comfort and perhaps amusement and charm uh and so that's what I try to give online and in public as well so it's not hard at all not to express those opinions because um I don't feel like it uh, the more that I put, like, pleasant and fun things out into the world, the better time I have on the internet. Like, I'm, I think I'm one of the few authors who still really enjoys places like Facebook and Twitter and stuff. And that's because of you guys in the group and because of the way I've, I've tailored my feed to my needs, which is, like, I jump on Twitter and I look at feeds about costumes and octopi and stuff like that. And I see a few political things. But I'm not going to retweet them. I'm not going to respond to them. Um, instead, I'm going to talk about, like, <laughs> historical costuming and, and octopi and stuff. That's because that's what I want to put back out into the world. Um, and and maybe it's avoiding the problem. or I don't know. But um, I just want to try and make things better. And we all know that there's hard times right now. We all know that. So uh, me just saying what everybody else is saying about how bad things are is not helping. Um, instead, I want to help by being like, look, here's, a, here's something awesome that's also happening. So, yeah. I mean, I will occasionally get a little political, especially during, during Pride and especially on Tumblr, um, because that seems like the place for it. But that's the most I get, politics-wise. And occasionally I'll talk on, on um, like podcasts or something about it. But generally speaking, I just, like I said, I don't want to contribute to the culture of outrage. Um, I find it exhausting. I don't want to be exhausted <laughs> all the time. Um, everyone's talking about your soup. <laughs> That's a good, wow, this has been a really serious live. I didn't mean to make it this serious. I promise I'll bring the fun and the silly uh, back next time. I'm sorry if I missed anybody's questions. As always, I'll scan back through the comments and um, answer any questions that I might have missed. Um, if you're watching this on YouTube, go ahead and leave a comment below. If you have an additional question, I'll come and ch by and check it, I promise. And I'm not sure. I, in fact, I think I will not be having a normally scheduled live next month because of the office move and because I have kind of major events. The second Saturday, I have not only, an, it's an RWA thing, I also have, excuse me, suddenly got the hiccups. There's a horror for you. Uh, I also have a Borderlands um, uh, sponsor meeting that night. So I just have a lot of stuff going on. So I'm not sure I'll be doing a live in the month of November. I I'm so sorry. Please forgive me. Um, yeah, but I promise I'll keep you all up to date on what's going on with the office relocation. And keep an eye in the group for all of my uh, postings of fun, exciting collectibles. And meanwhile, if you want to share your favorite soup <laughs> and what you think it says about you as a person, <laughs> you can go ahead and put that in a comment. Um, if not, just try it at the next party you're at. <laughs> just be like, hey, uh, what's your favorite soup? <laughs> and then try to use it to analyze the person's character. It's lots of fun, I'm telling you. You can make wild assumptions. They're usually entirely inaccurate, but it's still fun. And it gets a conversation going. And what is more fun than talking about food? I ask you. Um, and on that note, uh, bye everyone. I will talk to you again soon, I promise, um, as soon as I can possibly arrange something. Uh, until then, have a wonderful Halloween. I, um, I hope whatever it is you do for Halloween, you enjoy it immensely. <laughs>